Speed triple combinations are bringing more efficiencies to Type 1 road train operators. We check out a cattle lift at Roma in Queensland. The Tanami Road has been called the road from hell and the worst main road in Australia. We travel Central Australia's track through the Tanami Desert. The Mac Bigfoot is hauling loads of more than 300 tonnes with the help of powered trailers in the goldfields of Western Australia. Kalgoorlie operator Doug Gould got sick of life as a subby and made the big step into prime contracting and found gold in them bar hills. We see the world record breaking attempt of the biggest road train haul in history. Will this Kenworth pull a string of 79 trailers weighing more than a thousand tons? A family transport operation with a difference. Paul Wanbon and his family run a freightliner as a subby between Perth and Kununurra, a leg of more than 3,000 kilometres. Roma is one of the main western centres in southern Queensland. It's a pivotal town for the pastoral, oil and gas and wine industries. With road train routes leading into Roma from the four points of the compass, the town is home to many transport operations. Warwick-based Fraser's Transport has a depot in Roma. This family-owned company has made full use of new innovations in transport technology and has found running V triples on Type 1 road train or conventional doubles routes is giving a half deck advantage per unit. Six to nine extra steers each trip adds up to significant gains over the life of a unit. Ross Fraser is the managing director of the family owned company, a business started by his father hauling chooks and hay with a Ford body truck back in 1944. Today, the company runs 39 Kenworth Prime Movers and around 80 trailers. We asked Ross Fraser how the V Triple concept came about. It's been brought about um, mainly um, due to our, um, our, our very strong um, livestock carriers associations that we've got around the States and certainly very strong national project. And that's, um, that's, um, that, that's allowed us to um, access to more, more bureaucrats. For instance, and, uh, and I think it's, it's also told um, it's told government that we're actually serious about what we're doing. Um, we're there to we're there to um, we're there to um, um, to help government, I guess, rather than work against them. It's daylight at Roma. The first of the Kenworth T650s fires up, and the Cummins signature starts its warm-up procedure. All trucks are Kenworth T650s, except the signature-powered Iveco run by one of Fraser's permanent subbies. We've hitched a ride in a B-triple to get a load of steers bound for the North Australian pastoral company's Napco feedlots at Dorby. There are 24 decks to load on the Napco properties, two B-triples, two conventional doubles, and a couple of B-doubles will make the lift. We travel with David Scott, the triple driver, grain harvester and transport operator in his own right. The stability of the configuration is immediately noticeable. When asked how it handles, David reckons, fantastic, bloody fantastic. We leave the highway and roll out on a bush track. We're on Napco country. Napco runs several properties in the Roma area. They're used as staging paddocks for cattle coming in from the west and north. Here, the cattle are sorted by weight and prepared for finishing at the Napco Dolby feedlot.
The trucks park up, one behind the other, running up to the loading ramp. The Napco yards are state-of-the-art, built of steel cattle rail, plenty of shade, and the trucks load below yard level, so the steers don't face any sort of a climb until they hit the full-width ramp in the trailer and climb to the top deck. On the lead B triple, the ramp inside the trailer is lowered by electric winch and the driver opens the inter-trailer gates to allow straight through loading. The steers walk quietly up the ramp to the top deck. They walk through the trailers and are penned off, gates clang shut. The cattle stand quietly in the burned trailers, all riding on air, as the sign says. The T650s sit on Kenworth six rods, the trailers all on air. Ross says there have been huge advances in trailer design over the past decade. Trailer construction, I guess, is an area where we've seen some seen some major improvement with the, the, the um, advent of the new, uh, the new monocoque type trailers with the strength in the outside instead of the big chassis rails that they used to have years ago. Much lighter. Um, you know, we're running trailers around now that are three and four tonne at least. In some cases, five and six tonne lighter. And their durability is, is certainly there. In less than two hours, 24 decks are loaded. Cattle kept quiet, and all it requires is one stockman from Napco, plus the drivers. No shouting, no frayed tempers. The trucks pull out of Land Reef and head back towards Roma. Fraser says the B triple with its 20 foot, 30 foot, and 40 foot trailers has proved a very efficient combination. The B triples run type one road train routes, conventional doubles, and are built within the same length and height dimensions as a type one combination. They're a much safer vehicle. Their, their trackability is much better than a type one or type two road train. And, um, but, as I say, they do have their disadvantages because uh, access into some properties is, is a bit difficult with B-triples and it's more difficult, whereas if you, you, with your Type 1 road train, it's quite easy to break them up and take your lead trailer in, load it, come back, cross-load them and so forth. It, it's a little bit harder to do that with a, with a B-triple. We've got a lot of faith in the Kenworth product, obviously. The Kenworth are a very, very du durable truck, and I guess one of the major reasons why we like to buy Kenworth is the fact that the only thing they do is in it, the, only, the major thing is the only thing Kenworth is in the is sort of truck. And they're like, oh, they've got to make it work. So we're very happy with the Kenworth product. We've obviously had our ups and downs with them, and uh, service-wise, the dealers around the country are very good. From Roma, the Fraser fleet pulls up the meatworks hill. The signatures humming with the loads. The cattle will be chewing high grain rations before nightfall. And the Fraser trucks, ever rolling, taking cattle where they need to go.
was snapping axles every trip, every trip, every trip, every trip, every trip, every trip. When we have our wet seasons uh, and the roads are uh, washed out, or in the dry season, uh, there's not enough for money, not enough for money, not enough for money, not enough for money. Think of all the problems that you have at once, it's daunting. Like you, you could talk yourself out of going out there, going out there, going out there, going out there. Going out there. The Tanami. It's variously called track, road, or highway, at times a lot worse. It joins Alice Springs and Central Australia with Halls Creek and the Kimberley region of Western Australia. The road services the gold mines of the Granites and Tanami and large Aboriginal communities. Mines such as the Granites employ large numbers of workers from the centre and require large transport and industry support from Alice Springs. This means the businesses of the Tanami support a large part of the economy of Alice Springs. But in unprecedented wet seasons, the Tanami Road has been closed for more than 12 weeks out of the past 18 months. The closure has meant layoffs of subcontractors at the mines and road transport has ground to a halt for up to five weeks at a time. Brooke David is immediate past president of the Northern Territory branch of the Australian Trucking Association. And as general manager of Australian fuel distributors, he has had trucks running the Tanami for many years. The road gets a hell of a lot of heavy traffic and at the end of the day, it's a dirt road where the, um, that was built 30 year ago and over the years we've just been grading the top off and it's a money issue really. We just haven't poured enough money back into it for the amount of traffic that's going out there and it's renowned to be the roughest road in Australia. For many years there, um, we were snapping axles every trip. We designed a workshop in Western Australia in Kununurra where we, um, we'd pull one set of trailers back from the desert truck it unhook if it could go back out and hook under another set while we uh, replaced axles on, on the road train and, and serviced it. Brooke David and other operators claim the standard of Territory Roads has been deteriorating for 10 years. John R. Kitt is the Northern Territory's Transport Minister responsible for the maintenance and development of Territory Roads. We have a real concern. We have uh, mining companies who are out there mining. Uh, we have mining companies who have exploration license applications. We have Aboriginal communities. We have people uh, on the one hand who wish to contribute to the Territory's economy and therefore Australia's economy, yet and they're finding it hard uh, when we have our wet seasons uh, and the roads uh, washed out or in the dry season uh, there's not enough money uh, to be able to bitumenise and, and upgrade the road to uh, um, a status that uh, will, will keep it in good stead. And so we've got continuous problems with that sort of uh, development. While politicians and bureaucrats decide the future of the Tanami, life goes on and tough operators with tough trucks have found a transport niche operating where many would dare not go. Alice Springs based GNS Transport is one such company. Owned by the Bellato family since 1994, the business runs six Kenworths, 34 trailers and two full-time subbies. GNS run the Tanami around the clock seven days a week. Managing director is Robert Bellato, and the day-to-day -day running of the business is carried out by himself and his brothers Frank and John.
we had a trip organised with GLS. The trucks are loaded around Alice Springs. One will be carrying bagged cement used by contractors backfilling the mine. The second truck loads bulk cement into transportable bods. Sunday morning in Alice Springs. A cloud built up places a question over running the Tanami. The problem is discussed by Robert Bellato with driver Greg, while loading and tyres are checked. And it is decided the trucks will leave as planned. We asked the Bellato brothers why they chose Kenworth. They're the best. Yeah, we, we, we think they're the best money can buy for, for the work we do. Yeah. For the work we do, you couldn't get a bit better, better product. Yeah, we find them really rebuildability, so like, they rebuild really well. And, and we find when they match with the Caterpillar engine, you've got a, a really strong truck. A bitumen strip runs 140 kilometres out to the start of the Tanami Road. At the end of the bitumen, the trucks pull off the sealed road and deflate the steer tyres. Greg drops the pressure to 50 pounds. Low tyre pressure is pivotal in keeping equipment in one piece, according to the Bellato brothers. Before we, we, we go out on any of those roads, we let the whole triple down. So like in the winter, we might let it down to 65, mm. 60, when it's a little bit cooler. It's not too bad. Because the heat doesn't build them up this much. Yeah, eh? we, we, we've even tried right down as low as 57 pounds. Yeah, I, I usually run about 50 in my drives. I like that around there. And um, even around 45, 50 on your stairs, because that protects the truck a lot. You know? Yeah. That's probably one of the most crucial things running out there. If you've got your tyre pressures up on your trials, you're just looking at big damage, you know? This is the real start of the Tanami. This is the suspension crushing, tire hammering road that sends bearings ballistic and Conrods crashing. The Northern Territory Transport and Works Department has worked hard to repair the Tanami after the destruction of this year's wet. But compressing a year's freight into nine months is putting unprecedented pressures on the road. The Bellato brothers say they can't praise what the works department has done on the Tanami enough this year. So how do you spec up a truck so that it stays in one piece and turns a profit on a road like this? Oh, Johnny's good at naming that. Yeah, yeah. Like you, buddy, you do your best toward it, but like, there's always alterations you have to do to it. Yeah, yeah. Like you, strong, um, beefed up bonnet mounts and things like that. We've yeah. found that they don't come out of the factory strong enough. Yeah, uh, everything that breaks more than once, you've got to, you can't just hope to fix it in the way that it's uh, 
going yep. back to standard, you've got to you've got to rectify it in a way that's going to be a little bit stronger, a little bit better every time, a bit heavier, and so. Otherwise, you're just chasing the same problem time and time again if you don't fix it a bit heavier and a bit stronger and alleviate problems. The Bellato preference for the Tanami is the Kenworth 501 Brute with Tanami modifications. While the drivers like the T950s in the GNS fleet, the 501s are the day in, day out workers. Transport and Works has built sealed stretches over sections most vulnerable to deterioration come the wet. But if the road is to be a dependable all-weather artery to service communities, the mines and open an alternate route to the Kimberley for tourism and defence, then major investment is needed. The G&S trucks pull into the Tilmouth Well Roadhouse for a cover. And it's back on the track. With the slow slogging of the Tanami, Robert Bellato says Caterpillar engines are doing a good job. Any of the cats are, are good, the 550s or the 600s. Yeah, they, we, we, we get an equal, equal fuel economy out of all of them. Yeah, and they both, they all pull, like even our um, old mechanical ones. Yeah, the little 425. Yeah, we've got them beefed up. They run with the big boys now, you know, like yeah. we've changed the pistons and a few other little things. The trucks all have 18-speed transmissions and Rockwell or Eaton diffs. The Bellatos estimate that with a mix of infrastructure and running costs, the cost of running the Tanami is about twice that of highway running with comparable triple combinations. The challenge now is for the Territory Government to develop the Tanami to a level adequate to maintain production, employment and services in the Tanami region and the economy of Central Australia. What I need to do is mount an argument to Canberra so that the Commonwealth Minister can understand that we don't have the uh, opportunity to raise the revenue with such a small population like the other states and the ACT. If you think of all the problems that you have at once, it's daunting, like you, you could talk yourself out of going out there. Yeah. But if you, if you take each problem as it comes, one at a time, write it down and address that problem, you're right, you know, you'll, you'll come the end of the day, you'll, you'll still be, you'll, you're still trucking, you know. Yeah. Kalgoorlie is a regional city of around 30,000 souls, living in the midst of the gold fields of Western Australia. Kalgoorlie is built on the Golden Mile, the gold fields discovered by Paddy Hannon in the 19th century. Even today, rich gold deposits are being found under the town, and in the streets, the richness of heritage is maintained in the architecture as a memory of years gone by. Recent history blends with the past, with a banner proclaiming support for the families of American victims of the events of September 2001. But gold is the business in hand of Kalgoorlie and its residents. The town is built on businesses supplying services to the gold mines. October is Expo time in the West. The Goldfields Mining Expo, the GME, is on the world calendar of mining expositions. Certainly, it is the biggest in Australia. 
mining corporations, equipment manufacturers, and small businesses show and tell to an audience from around the world. The GME is organized by Kalgoorlie Boulder Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Gold is big business in the West, with $4.5 billion earmarked for exploration, capital works and production in the industry over the next financial year. Under the banners and bunting of the GME, you probably could buy anything from a gold mine to a wheelbarrow, if you knew who to speak to. The new trucks finding themselves on display at the GME were basic, utilitarian specs set up for a rugged life in the gold fields. Mostly any colour you like, as long as it's white. Caterpillar, predictably, had a big presence, reflecting the following the company's earth-moving and haulage equipment has claimed in mining over the years. Mack trucks have a fairly conservative showing, but not far from here, the biggest Max work, the domain of the off-highway Bigfoot. Cambalda St Ives, a huge gold mining complex at Cambalda, 80 kilometers south of Kalgoorlie. Nearly half a million ounces were produced from here during the year 2000. At Cambalda St Ives, the gold ore is mined from scattered satellite pits, stockpiled, then loaded onto haul trucks. The trucks cut the ore varying distances from the satellite pits to central crushers and mills, where the ore is fed into crushers, milled, and the precious metal extracted. On this site, the haulage legs are carried out by BGC Contracting. Monstrous Cummins signature-powered Mac Bigfoot Prime movers pull double trailer combinations with a rated gross weight of 240 tonnes. The company supplies haulage, road building and other services across the length and breadth of Western Australia and beyond. BGC is privately owned by Lynn Puckridge. Jeff Baker is plant manager for the company. He says the Macs have been functioning well in the St Ives operation. The spec is a um, Cummings uh, 600 horsepower signature engine with a Mac gearbox and Rockwell back end. Uh, they're on large, uh, large tyres, um, 1425s. Um, fifth wheel is a uh, King Post turntable. The trailers are manufactured by Boomerang Engineering and they um, carry, uh, as I say, about 70 tonne payload each. They are on spring with BPW 20 tonne axles, uh, cubic capacity uh, around about 40, 40 cubic capacity. As I say, there's two of them. In total, about 160 uh, all up. The Bigfoot is a heavy-duty Titan that has been custom-built in special build, resulting in an off-highway configuration suited to the high weights of ore haulage. The 600 horsepower and 2,050 foot-pounds of torque give more than adequate grunt for the heavy loads, driving through the Meritor rear end to the big 25-inch wheels, each wheel rated at five and a half to six tons. The gold ore is loaded into the big trailers. Differing ores from different satellite pits are blended at the mill, so the trucks pull hauls varying from a few kilometers up to 30 kilometers. BGC Contracting supplies trucks, trailers, loaders and all support services for the transport requirements of the mining process. Drivers work 12-hour shifts and trucks are carefully monitored through computer management to maintain control over per tonne efficiency and prognosis of any maintenance issues that arise. The truck climbs the ROM pad and unloads onto the mill stockpile. Different ores are tipped in different sections of the stockpile so the crusher feeder can maintain the correct blends. 
Gold mining in the St. Ives region was resumed in 1981, and since then, 35 million tons of ore has been mined. From this mountain of ore, more than 4 million ounces, or nearly 120 tons of pure gold have been poured, yielding a rate of 3.7 grams per ton over that period. After tipping, the truck heads back down the incline from the ROM pad. This is the job of these Big Macs, day and night, day after day, short leg and longer leg. The profit is in keeping the wheels rolling. To do this, BGC has maintenance centres wherever the company's trucks are working. And in looking for that extra edge, BGC has been a venture partner in developing powered trailers. We have a prototype trailer on this particular site and the reason we developed that is to increase our tonnages of course to make it more efficient and to work in the truck, uh, truck uh, manufacturer specifications. We, uh, these particular trailers we have two on site, uh, sorry one on site, uh, the second trailer is uh, hydraulically powered through a drive axle, has a Cummings engine on the back of it hooked up with a computerised system to, to, manage the, uh, to manage the trailer. It has uh, it's a high torque low speed operations. It has two functions, uh, high torque from zero to uh, about uh, 15 kilometres, from 15 to about 25. As I say, uh, they kick in and kick out. It's to uh, assist the, uh, the, the configuration in startup and, uh, and also in the low speeds to uh, stop any undue stress on our drive line. Uh, it's been successful. Uh, we're still trialling it, um, but overall very pleased with it. When the drive axles are working, the load on the truck's drive shaft is lessened to the degree that gross vehicle weights well in excess of 300 tonnes can be run on the legs. With the power boost on lift-offs and slow climbs, the manufacturer's recommended loadings are kept intact and the Mac Bigfoot heads out for another load, keeping the river of gold ore flowing, the lifeblood of the gold fields of Western Australia. One thing Kalgoorlie operator Doug Gould has found to be successful, you have to do it your own way. And this bloke's no ordinary operator. One of the truck stars at the Goldfields Mining Expo was Doug's latest Kenworth T904, hooked up to four side tipping trailers, called variously an AAB combination, or three and a half, if you prefer or as they call them in the West, a quad set. It's a pretty smick looking outfit. They don't come much bigger than this for a road registered unit. Doug Gould was a battling subby who decided to make the big jump into prime contracting just at the right time, with the introduction of four trader outfits combined with concessional loading in Western Australia. He went all the way and put a tri-drive outfit together on tri-axle dollies. With a quality control system, we're allowed a, an extra three and a half tonne per troy group, so it was coupled with that direction and um, onboard scales and it all sort of coming together, yeah. The first contract we won, I guess, is um, independent contractors away from subcontracting um, was a, about a 100k lead uh, on bitumen, so it's sort of a needle new approach. The quad uh, thing came in at the same time as concessional loading was introduced. Doug worked smart and caught the wave of change and surfed it all the way to the present. He left the old mindsets of the transport subcontractor behind and approached jobs holistically, offering mining companies the full transport package. Today, he and his people are in the business of working with miners, reviewing as yet unbuilt mines and designing haul road infrastructure.
His company builds the haul roads and supplies transport services for the life of the mine, which in the scattered satellite pits of the gold fields could be anywhere from one to seven years. Starting out as an owner driver, today, Doug supervises more than 50 employees. This particular truck was the one used by Gould Transport to claim a place in the Guinness Book of Records as pulling the longest road train in history. Anyhow, more about that later. The truck is being loaded at a pit being worked by Paddington Gold. Doug's trucks run legs as short as a few kilometres to long hauls from Port Hetland to Cambalda, measured in thousands of kilometres. It seems the quad sets of trailers are instrumental in the Gould trucks maintaining the competitive edge. But does the high investment pay off? Yeah, the quads, as I say, it's coupled with the concession loading system. Without that, it'd be marginal. The uh, control we have put in place there and maintain means that we uh, don't have issues with um, fines. The quality control system that went in place covers maintenance and fatigue management as well, so it's made it made our business um, you know, come together a lot tighter than it was. It would have been without those systems in place. Paddington Gold runs many gold operations in the gold fields. The structure is simple. Gold ore is mined from satellite pits and hauled into the company mill for processing. The trucks, like this bogey drive subby, pulling a Gould quad set of side tippers, run the leg and tip on the move. The driver dumps his back two trailers first. Then circles the ramp and goes in again to tip his second trailer. And once more around the block, and he tips his lead trailer. The ore from different pits is stockpiled by the mill loader and fed to the crusher as needed to maintain the right blend. This truck is bringing four trailers of ore from mines at Port Hetland, a round trip of more than 3,000 kilometres for treatment at Cambalda. Doug says fatigue management is an important issue, especially on the longer runs. Yeah, we've implemented a system which is in line with state requirements. Yeah, I've got a few reservations about um, parts of the national and state regulations on fatigue management, uh, as in being too lax in some areas. So uh, we sort of tend to manage it um, with people and um, various requirements of individual operators rather than uh, blanket everyone with the, with the one system. Triple and quad road trains are not allowed south of Kalgoorlie, so the Port Hetland truck drops his back two trailers and heads for Cambalda as a double. One of the Gould block trucks hooks on to the remaining trailers and it too heads to Cambalda. So, why does Doug Gould prefer Kenworth's yeah, well, there's resale service and um, <clears throat> the guy behind the wheel, if, he's, if he doesn't like the truck, um, it's very hard to quantify what that's worth. Um, if he loves the truck, well, then you can have a man that's happier or, or an operator that's happier and um, will treat the gear with greater respect, I believe. 
And that's just about where we came in. But there's more to come from Doug Gould. If you're going to set out to break a world record, then you need to start the day with a decent breakfast. And Doug Gould has organised a decent feed for all the volunteer helpers on a day when he hopes a world record will fall. Eight months planning this shindig, keeping the law and government on side. Eight months of talking and planning and organising. Because if you're going to blow the boys from Meriden out of the water, everything's got to be just right. And here she is, the Doug Gould Kenworth 501 Brute, parked on a private hall road. There's been 48 hours just assembling 79 trailers, and they're scattered in groups of eight or ten on hall roads all around the Goldfields Highway, north of Kalgoorlie. Just pulling these numbers of trailers and dollies together builds a sense of community in the Kalgoorlie transport industry rarely seen before. The Cummins man seems confident. A 600 horsepower signature will be the powerhouse of today's 1,000 tonne plus attempt. The current world record was set by Marley's transport of the Western Australian wheat town of Meriden in 1999. Today, the mining boys hope to push the grainies out of the ruler's seat. The 501 Brute lifts off with a comparatively lightweight of only 12 trailers. The time has come to assemble the big combination and the 501 pulls the first string towards the Goldfields Highway. Duck Gould has organised the day as a fundraising event and hopes to raise more than $100,000 for the planned Australian Prospectors and Miners Hall of Fame. One and a half kilometres of air hose, 7,000 cable ties, 2,000 hose clamps and several motor-driven air compressors are needed to maintain an air supply to the trailers and braking safety. Block trucks tow the assembled groups of trailers from the Hall Road assembly points to the highway. She's on the highway, big and beautiful. All trailers have gone over the pits in the past 24 hours to ensure brakes and airlines are working and secure, that all air couplings and drawbars are the correct type. A stuff up now could put the whole attempt in jeopardy. On the starting line, wheels are chopped, just to be sure. Stag Matthews is the driver who will make the attempt. Looks calm, but the butterflies must be starting to flutter. Each block truck brings in its own string of trailers, parks them in line and pulls out. An outrigger has been attached to a big loader and this is connected to the lead dolly drawbar. While a block truck pushes the trailers from behind, the loader guides the drawbar into the ring feeder of the last trailer of the previous set. A crowd is gathering. Doug Gould expected the workers, families, and maybe a hundred onlookers from Kalgoorlie. But more than 5,000 spectators now line the attempt route. 
Main road surveyors have taken an accurate length of the now assembled road train. 1,018 metres, more than a kilometre long. Hmm, some truck. As liftoff time approaches, Doug is looking worried. A thousand what ifs on his mind. With liftoff time imminent, Stag is still looking composed. He's been one of Doug's drivers for seven years. There are a lot of unknowns in the next few minutes. Will the engine and driveline hold against the huge mass? Will transmission and diff temperatures hold? Or will the oil boil with the load? And she lifts off. A shutter and the 501 is lugging more than a thousand tons. The truck crosses the official starting line. Eight kilometres to run. Temperatures lift. Higher than normal. But they settle. High but steady. And all that work and organisation is behind. The event, Doug's Tug, rolls to its climax more than eight clicks down the Goldfields Highway. The results are impressive. Prime mover and 79 trailers. Total length 1,018 metres. Total weight 1,072.3 tonnes. The road train travelled 8.127 kilometres. More than $150,000 were raised for the Australian Prospectors and Miners Hall of Fame. Doug Gould's name is in the Guinness Book of Records. And on the last trailer, another touch of Doug Gould's humour, having the final crack at the previous record holders. Doug Gould, a Western Australian transport operator who is doing it his own way. From Kalgoorlie, we organised to do a run with Perth-based Bunjima Transport. On Tuesday night, we left the goldfields, travelling north to make the daylight rendezvous with the Bunjima drivers at the mining centre of Mekathara. We drove through the night. While the Bunjima Freightliner finished loading in Perth around 8pm and drove through the night also. And at sunrise, we met at Mekathara. The Freightliner Prime Mover is owned by Paul Wanbon and family, trading as Bunjima Transport. The truck runs as a permanent subby for West Farmers Transport, pulling three trailers. Any day of the week, West Farmers trucks and trailers can be seen running north and south throughout Western Australia. West Farmers Transport began operating in 1924 as the Gascoigne Transport Company, founded by famous Australian aviator Charles Kingsford Smith and partner Keith Anderson. In 1995, Gascoigne became West Farmers Transport, today one of the largest transport networks in Western Australia. The company services mining, agricultural and pastoral centres throughout Western Australia, as well as regular runs to Darwin. The running mate for the Bunjima truck is a new Sterling, owned by another West Farmers subcontractor. The Great Northern Highway is busy with all manner of transport. Heavy loads running escorted and under permit for mines and large development projects in the north. And road trains of refrigerated trailers taking perishables north to return with loads of fresh produce from the irrigated farmlands of the Ord Irrigation Area in the far northeast of Western Australia. And it's to the Ord and the town of Kununurra that the Bunjima truck heads, loaded with dry and perishable goods for the border town, as well as drop-offs for the coastal town of Port Hedland and the Kimberley Centre of Fitzroy Crossing. 
most fleet trucks running long haul in Western Australia run two up or have two drivers to share the load. This method of maintaining safe hours at the wheel for drivers is sometimes fraught with personality problems. Not so with Bunjima, because here it's all kept in the family. Today, Paul Wanbon's sons, Tim and Ian, are sharing the load. This is how a stringent timetable is maintained. The truck running day and night and allows it to do the 7,000 plus kilometre round trip on a weekly basis. The freight liner pulls into Capricorn Roadhouse to top up with fuel. After travelling all night and half the day, the truck has reached the tropics. Paul discusses the run with son Tim. Then Ian checks Dad's technique with the fuel hose before grabbing a quick takeaway. The schedule doesn't allow for many sit-down meals. Paul has spent most of his life driving trucks. He's worked as a driver for Gascoigne and West Farmers for 20 years. When West Farmers started selling prime movers to drivers four years ago, Paul bought the Kenworth he'd been driving from new. The Kenworth gave his family business a kick start, but it hasn't been an easy road. From the early days, finding an operator willing to give a young Aboriginal lad a go, even today with a lifetime of experience behind the wheel. You know, you cop it, you know, with blacks and whites, you know, these, they sort of see you, you see you um, driving around in flash motor cars or, you know, expensive truck and that, and first thing they'll say, oh, you, oh, you might have got money from ATSIC or, you know, some Aboriginal organisation, but, you know, I think if they sort of sat down and talked to us, you know, they'll find a different story. They set up all these Aboriginal, you know, organisations to sort of help Aboriginal people, but, I mean, I, I, I tried using them, but, uh, you know, you sort of come against a brick wall or, you know, there's a lot of red tape attached to a lot, lot of the things. So, you know, I mean, I guess just like ordinary white people, I, you know, I just go out and just out on the open market and, you know, just present myself and, you know, just get finance where I can and um, really, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel a lot, lot better that way, you know, you sort of, you don't blame anyone if you, if you go downhill or things like that, it's, you know, it's my mistake or, you know, if, I, if we stuff the business up or something like that, it's, it's, it's our fault and, you know, it's... From Capricorn Roadhouse, the trucks keep nosing along the long, hot run north through the mining regions of the Pilbara. The old Kenworth was powered by a Cat 475 horsepower engine, instrumental in Paul Wanbon's decision to stick with Cat Power when buying the new Freightliner. We operated that for a while, you know, pulling triples, and um, we ended up doing 1.5. Four million kilometres, and the you know the motor out, they haven't touched the motor. So you know, very good run out of it. When it came to buying the new truck, price, comfort, and living space in a job where home is the cab for just about 24 hours a day were the decision points. We wanted something that we could stretch out and relax more. So this one just happened to have the 72-inch bunk in it, so we, we, we grabbed it. Price factor, the one that pushed it, pushed us over the line because you know we we looked at um, forty, fifty thousand dollars cheaper than the than the other other two that we looked at, and you know so far so good. You know everything sort of holding up okay. It's, as soon as we got got into so some something sort of popped up, we'd take it back and they rectified sort of thing. Bunjima, we got that name from you know the the tribe that I, that my mother and, and and us sort of came from, which is you know around the Tom Price Hammersley Range area. So we thought, well, you know, be something different. We'll just you use the 
word Bunjama is our trading name. The Bunjama Freightliner pulls into the northern coastal town of Port Hedland. Port Hedland is the main export port for the iron-rich Pilbara region. The value of mining from the Pilbara region in any one year is estimated to be in the vicinity of $10 billion. Port Hedland is home to many industries and businesses supplying services to the hungry mining needs of the Pilbara. The lead trailer is pulled forward and unloading Port Hedland general freight has commenced. Ian drives the West Farmers forklift while Paul sorts out the loading. Milk runs are part of life for the West Farmer subbies, as with most carriers servicing small communities across Australia. The sun sets and the final destination is still a day and a night drive away, allowing for drops at various communities. But not before a clean-up and a decent feed at the Port Hedland Roadhouse on the way out of town. Morning brings a very different landscape of Kimberley Rivers after driving through the night. At Fitzroy Crossing, the lead trailer is emptied, so it's dropped off behind the second and third trailers. It's dangerous to run an empty lead with loaded second and third trailers, so the prime mover is backed onto the drawbar of the dolly of the old second trailer, the one about to become the lead trailer. Ian pins the dolly and climbs into the Freightliner, and pulls the dolly out and runs around the block. With a little help from Dad, he reverses the dolly under the old lead trailer, now empty and demoted to third trailer. He now backs under the new lead and hooks up and begins the most challenging part of the exercise, reversing the double onto the third trailer, which he does with unerring accuracy. Paul taught all his sons to drive as soon as their feet could reach the pedals, or before. Complete once more, the road train pulls out of Fitzroy Crossing, ahead a day slog through the Kimberley, the schedule demanding arrival in Kununurra before sunset. The truck heads over the narrow bridge crossing the magnificent Fitzroy River. The 600 horsepower cat is pulling the load easily. With three drivers, each driver has one week off in three as the family rotates driving teams. In Halls Creek, a driver change and it's Tim's turn at the wheel. Halls Creek is another of the old Kimberley towns, straddling the borderline between desert and the rocky bluffs and rivers of the Kimberley. Creeks are dry in October, but these will be running in another two months, slowing trip times down as the trucks have to wait for rivers to subside during the wet season. A southbound triple carrying the green hay of the Ord irrigation area, an indication our destination is getting closer. 
we travel through magnificent Kimberley landscape. Paul Wanbon has faced it all through life, taken away from his parents as a five-year-old and thrown into a mission, battling on to make a career in transport, getting knocked down but coming back to keep on trying, finally finding people to give him a go, and he in turn made a go of it. And on top of that, several heart bypass operations, and he still runs up the track with an incredibly positive attitude, an attitude supported and mirrored by his family, because this is what this operation is all about, a family affair. As we pull over the diversion dam into Kananara, Paul Wanbon is a role model for young Aboriginal people. Nope, all young people. He rejects handout culture says that's not the real world. The real world is, if you want something in life, you know, go out and get it, you know, just. I mean, it's out there, you know, it's, you, you just, you know, you're no different to whites or whatever, you know, you just go out there, put it in your mind, you're gonna do it and you grab it, I, I guess. Paul Wanbon and Bunjima Transport, a positive story and something in there for all of us. Well that's about it for Road Train 5, I've clocked up 20,000 kilometres and driven right around Australia and collecting these stories. It's always a breath of fresh air to engage with the open friendliness of drivers, owners and their families in the transport industry. I'd like to thank all of those who have assisted in the making of this program. Just about time to go, but hang around and take a look at Doug Gould's world record breaking road train in its entirety. Amazing stuff. Bye for now. See you down the track.